section is on animal behavior and a behavior is a way to respond to a stimulus. So um, a stimulus is actually something in the environment that causes you or an animal to have a reaction. So many behaviors that an animal has are there because it helps the animal stay alive and to live long enough to reproduce. Some examples of that might be uh, defending its territory for food or defending its territory for mating privileges. Um, another example could be migrating uh, with the seasons and doing that will help them go where they can survive, where, you know, the hot or the cold, it'll maybe um, they'll find more food or maybe that's where they will find a mate. So that's why animals have a variety of um, behaviors. So an innate behavior is basically one that's just on instinct. So what are some innate behaviors that you have? So like if somebody, if you're like playing a game and the ball gets thrown at you or you see something flying towards your head, you're gonna kind of naturally like duck out of the way sometimes, um, even though you didn't think about it ahead of time. Or if you walk outside and maybe you squint your eyes if it's really bright, or even a newborn human baby will immediately start um, nursing and sucking um, to nurse even though nobody taught the baby that you know there you know drinking milk will fill your belly and you'll feel better and warm and happy it, like, nobody taught the baby that the baby just instinctually will do that so um, those are all innate behaviors so when an animal has a number of behaviors in a row in a pattern that can be called a fixed action pattern so for example like a, in your book it gives a great example of a baby bird will maybe make a chirping noise that it's hungry then it'll raise up its head then it'll stretch its neck really far and eat food from its mom so it does a number of things in a row um, that are innate that is a fixed action pattern the next type that we're going to talk about is learned behaviors and i'm so glad they showed a horse here um, learned behaviors are ones that are a mix of innate behaviors and things that we have learned over time. So one example of that is this word called habituation, which it must be up here. There it is, habituation. So a habituation is basically getting used to something that's usually something, it can be something positive, but it can be something negative that's just kind of an annoying. So for example, my daughter rides horses and she's constantly trying to get her, her horses. She tr trains a different horse every few months. Um, she's trying to get the horse trained and get used to different stimuli like a dog, the neighbor's dog running up to the fence and barking at the horse, you know, and it spooks some of the horses. Well, eventually the horse gets habituated or used to that. Or when she's tacking up, like putting on the saddles and things, um, some horses have had some kind of bad past, who knows, that they're afraid of being saddled up. So she tries to get them habituated or used to that behavior. The next one that we're going to talk about is Pavlov's dog. If you've ever heard of that, that is a type of classical conditioning. What he did was he put food in front of the dog, like something tasty, like beef or something, and then he would ring a bell. And eventually the dog would just hear the bell and start salivating because it felt like it was going to get food with the bell. Um, this happens to my dogs with a bell at the front door. They just assume some bad guy is here to, to kill us or something, I don't know, and so they'll go up and bark. Um, or like with my dogs, we can say, all right, we're gonna go, and they hear that word go, and they know they're gonna get left behind, so they start freaking out, running to the door, and acting like they're the most important thing on the planet. You can't leave me behind again. So that is called classical conditioning. Um, the next example, I'm sorry, this looks really boring, but it's called operant um, conditioning. And this where, is where a, an animal starts to associate a certain um, stimulus, something that happens with a reward or a punishment. So in a positive way, this could be like a mouse being taught to run through the maze and getting cheese at the end. That would be a positive example. A negative example would be like one of my kids one time 
um, decided to put their whole whole finger down an ants an ant hill. I don't know why. And they got bit like crazy. It was like some kind of very painful ant bite all up in the, down their hands. And anyways, now they learned to not do that. So they learned to not go near ant hills. They learned it the hard way. I don't know why it took that. <laughs> but at any rate, that's operant condition condition. The next one is called imprinting and that only happens for a tiny tiny short period of time of a baby's life and only some animals do this like salmon do this with the chemistry of the water and in which they're born in and whooping cranes can do this but it's where the animal for a very short time as a baby um, remembers permanently certain conditions so they can imprint on their parent and remember that's my parent and make that bond or um, like salmon, they're, they're imprinting what the water was like so they can come back and lay eggs in it the exact same spot. The next is called cognitive behaviors and cognitive behaviors are thinking, reasoning, processing through things. And of course, chimpanzees are so intelligent and they can use um, different tools to reach stick down, sticks down uh, termite hills and pull them up and eat the termites. They, uh, primates can, uh, well, even ravens. I was just at the Grand Canyon. Ravens can fully open zippered backpacks and steal out food. They are just, you know, they're using different things and can reason through situations. The next one we're going to talk about um, is a type of competitive behavior, which is called agonistic behavior. And this is when two animals of the same species, usually they're not out to kill each other, but they're out to let each other know, I am the dominant one in this area, you go away, until one of them eventually does. The northern elephant seals, there's live webcams on those. I highly recommend you go watch the northern elephant seals. Those males cannot help but fight constantly, and they have giant wounds down their side because they're always fighting over territory and space. It's just one of the ways they are. Um, and then chickens do this. You can see this chicken is being pecked like crazy. You may not know that from, but somebody that's raised chickens, I have raised chickens. This chicken has is tower, you know, cowering down to this chicken because this one is lower in what's called the pecking order. And this one is more of the like mother hen that's in charge. And some chickens are just meaner and some are nicer. But they will um, say, hey, I'm dominant and keep all the other females in line and not let them in certain spaces and whatever. That's just a dominance hierarchy. The next is a territorial behavior where they want a certain space and control of that um, area. Another one is called a foraging behavior. That's where they're looking for certain nutrients or food. So they're foraging for things. And then there's migratory behaviors where they're migrating to different places. Okay, so switching gears from behaviors a little bit, um, a type a, of um, cycle that we go through is called the circadian rhythm. And that's a cycle that occurs every every day or uh, certain times of the year and it's you repeat it over and over and over again um and this is just showing you that when you have a normal light dark light most most organisms will go to sleep in the dark um but if you have continual darkness like organisms will slowly move up their um fatigue time so it's kind of important you know to have natural light and see things in the light and dark and you know as it starts to get darker at night shut off some light so you naturally start to feel tired um so different animals communicate by pheromones that's leading out or giving out certain scents or auditorially making different um sounds they can also have courting behaviors for mating or nurturing behaviors for taking care of their young um, nurturing behaviors, I want to mention, come with some positives and negatives. The positives is a, a lot of the babies live when the parents nurture them and take care of them. The drawback is um, that it's a high amount of energy for the parent. So um, most animals that highly nurture their young do not have as many young. 
Um, an animal that does not take care of their young, so think of like, a, a generally fish don't, they'll just lay a bunch of eggs. So they'll have hundreds of eggs and hope a couple survive, but they just swim away and they, there's not a lot of nurturing a lot of times. Okay, then last one that we're gonna talk about is altruistic behaviors. And altruistic behaviors are those that um, where one organism will actually sacrifice itself for the good of the whole group. So um, uh, this is uh, naked mole rats. Um, they they can can do this at times. They actually are an amazing creature that have learned to like I think go a long period of time sometimes without oxygen. But at any rate, um, there's a, like meerkats are a great example of an animal that one of them, like if there's a predator around, will make a lot of noise, warn all the others, even if it means it draws the predator off to them and they die. So um, altruistic behavior. We have some humans like that that will do a lot of good for others, even though they might be, you know, not helped at all in that circumstance. So that's what we have for this section.